Welcome to everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for attending this webinar um, part of the Mobile Mapping Essential series. And um, this one is about highway corridor workflows in TBC with MX9 data. So introduction, um, <clears throat> I always start with the first few slides for those of you that are new to mobile mapping. Um, so we have several products in our mobile mapping portfolio. The MX9, the MX2 and the MX7. The MX9 is our kind of flagship product which produces very dense point clouds, high accuracy and can be used for survey and engineering kind applications. The MX2, which is for smaller projects, less dense point cloud, and the MX7, which is um, imagery only product um, designed for capturing mobile images and is more of an asset management and documentation product. For the purposes of this webinar, we are going to be focused on MX9 and MX9 data. So just a little bit about um, the hardware before we dive into the software. Um, so what does an MX9 consist of? We have uh, a roof rack that goes on the vehicle is rigidly mounted. Um, and then we add the MX-9 sensor head to that. So the MX-9 consists of 360 degree camera plus two oblique cameras looking kind of sideways and then um, uh, laser scanners, two laser scanners or one laser scanner and an IMU and GNSS system for navigation. We can add a secondary antenna, which we recall GAMS, which helps with heading determination of the system. Not compulsory, but um, often we advise it. And a DMI, which is a distance measuring instrument that fits to the wheel of the vehicle and provides a, basically an additional input for measuring distance, especially in a challenging GNSS environment, if the system goes into a kind of dead reckoning mode, the DMI um, provides some very valuable information. Inside the vehicle, um, normally we would install, uh, we would basically connect to the vehicle power supply, but normally we'd recommend um, installing a secondary uh, battery connected to the primary battery of the vehicle just to make sure that we're not uh, running it running the primary vehicle battery flat um, we have a power unit which does some voltage stabilization and then we have a control unit um, that sits inside the vehicle the control unit um, records the data onto removable ssds it also controls things like uh, Wi-Fi inside the vehicle or connecting to the MX-9. So then that connects up to the sensor head. So basically this is pretty much as it's shown there, single cables. So a lot of the complexity for mobile mapping systems has been removed here. And we have a fairly uh, simple installation process. Then to operate the system, you um, bring your own device. Um, you just use a web browser and connect via Wi-Fi to the MX-9 and operate the system from the web browser. So uh, it's almost like using an app to control the system. So the data we're going to look at in this webinar is um, a fairly typical mobile mapping uh, survey. 
it's true that with mobile mapping you can do very long and large projects and those do exist but quite often we see this kind of thing where somebody maybe wants to do some rehabilitation of a highway intersection or, or road junction and they would like a detailed survey doing of that road intersection so it's a pretty typical uh, use case. Um, so we recorded da data here in six runs. So the colors on the left-hand side show the different runs we made. So in both directions on both roads and then also the slip roads. So that's the kind of data we have. Um, yeah, in some cases, if it was a much wider road, so these this is basically a dual carriageway road, um, it might be necessary to do more runs if it was a very wide road. If it was like four or six lanes either side, you'd probably want to do even more. Okay, so that deliver us. Uh, delivers to us those um, separate runs. A run, by the way, in our uh, mobile mapping language is basically uh, defined by a star, a start and stop recording. So if we start the laser scanners and the camera and then stop it, that defines a run, basically a batch of data, LiDAR and image data for which we have um, positioning information available. So that's kind of what a run is. Um, so here I'm going to look at these two runs um, basically going in either direction along this highway and just kind of go through the process of how you might handle this data to, to deliver something that was useful for um, construction or highway design or highway redesign etc. So first of all data capture. I mentioned to you that we connect to the system. Uh, let me just start this. This is your video. Um, we connect to the system using a device. Um, it could be uh, often it's a tablet, could be a PC, could even be a cell phone. Um, and then this is the kind of uh, display you see with a browser. We're using Google Chrome here. We can see uh, laser profiles to check the lasers are working. We can go to a navigation screen to understand the status of the system. So you'll see the heading was fairly high there. It's getting lower as the system kind of initializes and warms up. Um, so you can see uh, sky plot and uh, various other navigation kind of parameters. Um, you can also then um, see the images themselves, make sure that's working. And when you're ready to go, you press the button in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see it's turned red. And that means we are now recording a run. So, um, You'll see on the left hand side, we have a trajectory that's gone into kind of a bold kind of font, if you like. Um, so that means when it were it's bold, that's where we actually recorded data. And that particular instance, we didn't have a background map on the left hand side, but um, it's possible if you have internet connection to display um, background maps as well. So the next step in the process is to pro process the vehicle's trajectory. We do that in a piece of software from our sister company at Aplanix in a piece of software called POSPAC. And basically what POSPAC will do is it will take the real-time trajectory information, so that's the GNSS plus the inertial data plus the data from the DMI. We will process that against a GNSS base station, 
and that will provide us with an improved post-processed trajectory. This we call an SBET uh, or smooth best estimate of trajectory. In simple terms, you can think of it as like um, post-processing kinematic data, but with added inertial and DMI information. So the result in PUSPAC is we get a processed trajectory. So this would now be at the centimeter level. Um, this is why we do it. So you'll see here the uh, purple or magenta trajectory was the uh, real time. And then the green is the post-process trajectory. So you'll see it's moved a few meters and it's much more consistent within itself because it's been processed. Um, there are also a whole bunch of tools in Postpack to validate your data and provide some level of quality control. Uh, this is one particular chart that I like to look at. This is the um, RMS position errors um, for north, east, and up or down. Postpack calls it down, but it's up. Um, so you'll see the northern easting errors around about the centimeter level and the uh, down or up error is around about the two centimeter level. So pretty much what you would expect, pretty similar results to what you might expect from an RTK system, for example. So next step is registration and point cloud processing. So these are functions that we have over the last uh, couple of years added to TBC. For data extraction, we, um, we kind of have two different pieces of software for data extraction, depending upon your application. So for survey and engineering kind of deliverable, deliverables and simple CAD extraction of line work, we have TBC, Trimble Business Center. And that's what I'm gonna focus on today because we're pretty much focused on uh, engineering deliverables in this webinar. But just to mention, we also have Trimble MX, which is more for the asset management applications where you're wanting to put the data into a GIS system or a big kind of geodatabase and uh, maybe interested in sharing deliverables online across an organization, then we would go the Trimble MX route. But just in case anybody was expecting a Trimble MX presentation, this is not it. We're going to focus here on TBC. So the workflow so far, uh, or the workflow, the complete workflow looks like this actually. So I've already talked a little bit about capture and a bit about um, processing the trajectory. I'm now going to say a few words about registration, and then we go on to colorizing the point cloud, classifying the point cloud, creating a surface, creating an alignment, creating a corridor, contours, and a drive-through. And then I'm also going to talk about connecting to some other Trimble civil engineering products with the resultant data from this. So the next step in TBC, you have to assume here because we are doing very much an engineering kind of application, so in short, we're looking for a centimeter level solution here. So um, to be sure that we're getting centimeters, we are going to use control points. So we have a bunch of control points you'll see on the right hand side that um, those control points are visible within the point cloud. 
and our goal is to register to those control points and then also register run one to run two so that we're sure that the registration between the two point clouds is also good. So this is the process. Uh, I'm not going to show this because it's relatively straightforward, to be honest. It's basically clicking on the point cloud, clicking on the on the uh, control points. Um, it does take a little bit of time, um, but this is basically the workflow. Register, run one to the control points, and then register, run two to run one, and then update um, the scans and colorize the point cloud from the uh, simultaneously recorded imagery. So the result of all that would be um, we would get a computed point cloud in TDC that's directly georeferenced to our trajectory as it was processed in POSPAC maybe slightly adjusted to the control points if that was the process we went through. So on the right hand side here, you would see um, a colorized point cloud. And you, we would have also during this phase, if it was necessary to adjust the position and the alignment of the imagery because of the registration process, we would also have taken care of that during this step. So here we have, this is uh, the data that I'm talking about, this uh, data in uh, Denmark um, of a road intersection. You'll see we have our colorized point cloud here and you can see the various um, trajectories overlaid on that. So once we have our colorized point cloud, there's a very nice auto classification feature in TDC that will auto classify the point cloud into five classes, <clears throat> buildings, ground, vegetation, posts and signs, and power lines. So why do this step? You may not be particularly interested in classifying the point cloud, but going through this step helps you enormously in working with the point cloud data. So in our example here, we want to work with the class ground level because we want to build a ground model. So what this classification process allows us to do is switch everything else off. So we just have the ground points. Similarly, if you were, you know, extracting power lines, it's pretty useful to be able to switch everything off, just leave the power lines on and then work on the power line class for your power line extraction. So now getting into the um, details of the corridor workflow. So following our classification, um, what I've done here is through the uh, view filter manager in Trimble on the in TBC on the left hand side, I've switched everything off and the point class point cloud regions apart from ground. So what I'm seeing on my screen there are just the points that have been classified as being on the ground. So once I have that, um, what, the next step I'm going to take is to downsample a point cloud of the region, one for the purpose of this dem demonstration, and two, because um, it's a good idea to downsample the data anyway, 
um, because it's too dense actually for building a meaningful DTM. So what I'm going to do here is just select a small portion of this road to work on to demonstrate the capability here. So I've called it existing ground sample. I've selected a particular area and I'm going to downgrade the spacing to five centimeters for building my DTM or DGM. So you see, I'm just left with a sparser point cloud of the area of interest with the points at five centimeter spacing approximately. So this is what I'm left with, um, from which now I am going to um, create a surface. So from my decimated data, if you like, I'm going to um, create a surface. So I'm going to call this um, original ground because it represents the, the ground as it is. And select the area of interest and say OK. doesn't take too long to compute. It's quite a small area. So now um, I have my uh, existing ground uh, surface displayed with the point cloud on top. I'm going to switch the point cloud off. So now I just have my surface. I'm going to select the surface and I'm going to go into properties and I'm going to change uh, some of the display parameters so that you can see it properly. And I'm going to change the shading so that the shading is by um, elevation. I'm going to do that in plan and in 3D, 3D view mode as well. So now you can see the um, ground surface shaded um, by elevation. And if I look, in uh, the 3D view, you will see the ground model uh, with its uh, triangles that I've just switched off. Um, highlighted by elevation uh, color relating to elevation. So you see it's a pretty straightforward road with uh, kind of uh, embankment to the side and uh, then a ditch or something. So next step, so now I've got my, I've got my uh, ground model of the road that I'm interested in. And the next step is to um, create a line string for the center line of the road. So I'm creating um, a line string, I've called it road center line. Uh, I'm gonna put it on a, I'm gonna put it on a particular layer so I know where it is easily. So I'm just going to create a layer here called uh, road center line. So now I'm going to um, add points to this layer that I've set up and add points to the line string for the road center line. 
So I'm clicking on my road surface. I'm going to change it to a smooth curve. So it's going to put a smooth curve through these segments. Um, um, yeah, I add that to my road surface. And you'll see in 3D, that's the uh, point cloud with the road center line. Okay. So now that I've got my um, road center line, I'm going to create an alignment. So I'm going to create both a vertical and a horizontal alignment. Um, so in TBC, I go to corridors and I say create an alignment. Give it a name. Select the line that I'm interested in and say OK. So now it will display to me this is the uh, horizontal segments of the alignment it's created. And then I can also look at the vertical segments, change elevation of the uh, various um, steps along the vertical alignment. So now we have our surface and we have an alignment with vertical and horizontal components. And the next step is to create a corridor. So I go to the Create Corridor feature in TBC. I'm going to call it new road. So this is a new surface that I'm going to make, basically. Um, and it's going to reference the original ground surface. So I'm going to be comparing, if you like, my new design surface with the original ground surface. Now here I'm going to create some templates. So I'm just going to make up a road design here in TDC. But at this stage, you you may be importing uh, road design from, I don't know, from Bentley, from Inroads, or some kind of Autodesk product that does road design. Um, so I'm going to create a template here for a road design in TBC. But I think often in, in the real world, somebody might be importing this here from a road design package. So I'm creating an offset at 16 meter offset at a slope of 2%. And I'm saying that's what I want to design. So from the center line, you'll see there it's drawn a 16 meter um, lane, if you like, with a slope of 2%. I'm then going to do another piece to it, which is eight meters wide. And I'm gonna say it's a minus 2% slope. That means it will go down to the right. And I'm gonna say this is the shoulder of the road. So you'll see here at the bottom, you'll see the shoulder. So you'll see the blue piece there that's um, appearing on that cross section is actually um, indicating fill. That's where we would need to fill the road with material to get to that design shoulder um, template design. I'm then going to put a small piece on that I'm going to call bank, which is a, uh, I'm using an elevation now to go up um, to a particular elevation. So you'll see I've got 
And part of my road, on one side of the road, I have some kind of design overlaid over the top of my surface. Okay. What I'm going to do now to be very, very simple is I'm just going to mirror that to the other side of the road. So now I have a road design for that section of road and you'll see um, the uh, areas shading, shaded in blue on the cross section are areas of fill and the areas in red are areas of cut. So that's now my design overlaid with my existing ground. Um, so at this stage, I can move through this and move along the cross sections and see how it looks at various steps along the corridor. So once I have this information, got my design, got my existing ground, if I was in the business of earth moving and I had a machine control system, I could take these two elements, put it onto my Trimble machine control system and go and move the earth to build this design. Of course, I can also do things like create contours. So you'll see I've created a contour map here, which uh, may also be useful. And I can do things like this and create a drive through of the section of road that I'm, uh, the section of road that I've just been working on. Uh, I'm going to drive along the center line at 20 kilometers an hour. In fact, it's just driving through the point cloud here. I think I forgot to switch on the road design, but uh, you could have the road design on here as well and, and drive along the new design. Actually, that's quite useful uh, when you do have design and um, an existing colorized point cloud together and do these drive throughs. It's a, quite a useful tool for kind of doing some coarse uh, kind of clash, clash detection, etc. So although you might have um, you might have covered all your bases in terms of your road design maybe the design doesn't show you things like you know where you've got vegetation encroachment or where you've got um yeah trees that are kind of in the way or whatever um so this is a useful tool for being able to find those kind of things So we've illustrated to you how to capture very quickly using um, AMX9 an accurate 3D data uh, using mobile mapping and utilize that data for contributing to the constructible model. And as many of you will know that are, have anything to do with construction, once you have these designs in TBC, very easy then to take them to machine control and to start building. Some other things I just wanted to mention that uh, maybe uh, would will be new to, to, to many of you, and I'm not saying I'm an expert in this area, but I think it's important to point out some of the potential kind of additional workflows that are available once you're into in, into this uh, constructible model cycle. So um, Trimble Business Center allows you to cut, yeah, to calculate the, you know, the cut and fill volumes between the design and the existing, as we've seen, 
um, but you can also do other things that I haven't shown, like looking at in situ layers where you might have clay and rock. And then also on the design side, have different layers where maybe you can have different design materials such as sand and gravel and that kind of thing. Um, you can also do some reasonably sophisticated um, haulage calculations, mass haul calculations, um, that will show you things about the location and the price and other parameters of how you can borrow materials uh, from certain sites and, and use them at other sites. And we'll also take into account things like haul roads that you might need between the various borrow and waste sites and it will automatically cal uh, calculate the balances of material on these whole ranges. And then you can also um, provide this level of output to Trimble Telos for construction scheduling and then also into Vision Link or monitoring the more holistic construction process. So from a mass hall point of view, um, what are people generally trying to achieve there? So the black line in the middle is our design um, and the green line is our existing ground, right? So we have to take this lumpy thing and make it into a flat line, if you like. Um, so we're going to need um, some excavators to excavate the material where we have too much and then we're going to need some dump trucks to take it to the locations where we don't have enough material and we want to optimize that whole process of moving material from one location to another and we're talking big dollars here if you get it wrong. So being able to optimize that whole of materials is important. So in uh, TDC, you can get a mass haulage report. Um, you can also include information about different types of material, about the type of equipment you've got, whether it's a dozer or an excavator or a dump truck and all that can be um, analyzed and used to assess the mass haul process in TBC. So you can produce things like mass haul diagrams that will give some indication about how material um, is planned to be moved around the site. And then you can also do things like look at cross-section views of the proposed alignment with layers representing different surface types. So in this case here, I think there's, um, there's the finished roadway, there's the, a layer of sand, there's a layer of rock. So all these things can be uh, viewed and analyzed in TBC. So then Trimble has this um, product called Trimble Telos, which allows you to take this analysis of mass hall to a whole new level. So you can populate um, the Telos scheduling software with information about your materials, the location, the hall ranges, the equipment you've got to move the material, the costs involved, the people you've got, and you can look at a way for optimizing your schedule for building the road. So you get kind of a Gantt chart linked to kind of a mass hall diagram of the road that you're going to build, and you can schedule all the activities required to optimize the amount of money that needs to be spent on building the road. So you can balance all these things, machines, labor hours, cut, 
fuel, all these things that can be optimized. So basically here, Trimble's kind of extended its connection uh, with, with our customers, if you like, through the ability to better plan resource and resource needs such as fuel and water and servicing through the constructible model. You can also plug in here things like uh, different production rates for 3D machine control resources versus say standard resources and show the effect on production rates and associated costs like service and fuel for um, specific activities uh, and what that can do to the overall project schedule. So I hope that's given you some ideas. I started kind of small with uh, mich with um, three um, mobile mapping and I've kind of gone a long way into the construction process, but um, I think um, the point here is that um, mobile mapping can be used as a basis for a lot of this kind of activity. And with that, I believe I am complete. Thank you, Peter. It seems we have a time for the several questions to be answered. So we already have started to answer your questions during the session, as we got uh, quite a bit. Uh, let's start uh, with questions which have been not answered yet. And then also, if time uh, allows us, we will um, go deeper to questions which have been already answered. OK, so the first question. Interested to know how accurately adjusted when run-to-run -run registration performed. Okay. Pete, would you be so kind to answer it? Yeah. So you are. Can, can, can you still hear me? There was some doubt in your voice there. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. <clears throat> so as far as accuracy is concerned, so obviously. As I mentioned earlier on, um, you know, the main error source in mobile mapping is basically the GNSS. So it does depend upon your GNSS coverage. We do have some additional sensors that help us compared with normal surveying because we have an IMU and we have a DMI. <clears throat> um, and also we have control points. So the point of the control points is to try to eliminate any uh, error that's crept in because the GNSS coverage kind of wasn't so good in a particular area. So if you have good control points and you are able to do um, registration of your trajectories and then able to do registration of, of cloud to cloud, if you like, um, we're able in general to get down to about a centimeter, I would say. Um, important point to make about mobile mapping, and this is, I think a lot of people forget this. Many of us out there, not saying all of us, but many of us will be surveyors that have got involved in this business. And you don't just forget about surveying because you've now got this sophisticated piece of equipment, right? It's it's not a black box. The usual rules of surveying that we've all learned over the years still apply. So data redundancy, checking, control points. This is the role the surveyor plays in this process, right? So you can't just assume that this is a magic black box and you don't need to do all the things that you've learned if you were using a total station or a GPS receiver. You still have to do those things. You still need redundancy. You still need to check things. Um, so that's you know basically the best way to do it is to make sure you build in checks to make sure that you're getting the accuracy you are looking for. But of course, it does have its limitations and 
um, you know, we've talked here about construction. You know, one aspect of construction might be, you know, I've heard people talk about three millimeters for the finished um, asphalt layer, right, in the construction process. So three millimeters in the vertical. Um, are you going to achieve that with mobile mapping? Probably not. Um, but can you get down to around about a centimeter? Probably yes. So that's my answer. Thank you, Peter. That was a really detailed answer. And now to follow up on the previous one, again about control points, again about the accuracy. What of the optimum spacing for control points and should they be set in pairs along uh, the roadway? Yes, uh, good question. I would, um, I'm just going from an experience of what other people do, to be honest. Uh, I think 100 meters seems to be a good number that people use. Uh, so, if, sorry if you're in America. So, two or 300 feet maybe in America, 100 meters in Europe. Um, would it help on both sides? Yes, I would say it would. Um, and I th I'd say the other thing that's important to do as well is think about doing some points that aren't, you know. I guess it's always, it's always easy to do points in the shoulder of the road somewhere or along the pavement or sidewalk at the side of the road. But I would consider doing points further back than that as well. So at, uh, if you like, kind of maybe 20 or 30 meters out from the center line of the road, because having some control points there, it will control any kind of uh, lateral twist you might put in terms of vertical along the roadway. So I'd, I would consider not just putting points kind of, you know, five meters either side of the road, but I'd actually consider going further back as well. Okay. Thanks, moving on. Um, next question. Instead of creating a line stream, can mathematical roadway center line be imported to point cloud today? It can be imported, uh, depends what you mean by the point cloud. We can't import that into our kind of MX9 system, but it can be imported into TVC, yes. Okay. So with that, uh, one more question uh, we do have. How do I uh, access the linear site takeoff and mass hole functionality in TBC? Um, okay. so some of those more um, advanced things I mentioned in TBC, they, they come from the Trimble um, uh, Business Center Heavy Civil Edition, which is now all consolidated into one homogenous TBC. Um, but uh, TBC is a kind of modular product and there are two modules in particular that cover many of those aspects and they're available in the uh, the site construction edition and also in the uh, infrastructure edition covers most of those areas yeah something to add just probably um, at uh, trimblegeospecial.com's uh, uh, website under the tbc section you also could find the tbc uh, feature matrix if you are interested in these details okay uh more questions when will mx2 data be capable with uh, of being processed in tbc it has been already answered in the chat and uh, we cannot say when we unfortunately don't have this answer but uh, answer we do have today is that uh, currently it's not supported you can process mx9 data in tbc but not mx2 yeah correct and if other systems, um, data out of other systems can be processed in TBC mobile mapping module? Again, other, system, yeah. other systems mean third party systems, does that mean? Um, I'm not sure if the person uh, who answered that question could just confirm, because it sounds like uh, mobile mapping systems indeed 
So if mobile systems meant under this, this question, then uh, not MX9 uh, data only can be processed in TBC mobile mapping today. Yeah, I mean, obviously we support the uh, MX7 as well, but probably the question doesn't mean that. Um, can we support other systems? I guess it means like, like a Pegasus or Regal system. Um, today, no, but I would say Probably the reason we've never done it is because nobody's really asked for it. Um, having done everything we've done for the MX-9, it might not actually be that difficult to do, but um, yeah, uh, today no, but uh, I'm not saying uh, it would be impossible. Yeah, just to add here, if you are talking about TBC capabilities for mobile mapping data, as Pete has already mentioned, MX7 data can be brought today to TBC uh, for uh, measurements, um, some uh, basic feature extraction, and uh, TBC advanced edition is required to perform those measurements out of MX7 data. Any more questions? It seems we don't have more questions. Anyhow, if you have more but didn't uh, uh, have a chance to ask um, everything you are interested in, please follow up with the email address uh, for our webinars. And uh, also, don't forget, you always could approach your local Trimble team um, to elaborate and uh, get more details. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Oh, one more question do we have? Can you do a progress of the project using a drone? Yes, you could do that, yeah. In fact, I originally looked at this workflow not for the MX-9, uh, but for a drone. So yeah, you could. Thank you, Peter. Thank you all and uh, see you at our next webinar. Bye-bye.